and fellowship with one another. Greet each other in the name of the Lord this morning. What a morning. Isn't it good to worship the Lord Jesus Christ? Praise his holy name. Thank you, Devon. Thank you, praise team, leading us before the Lord this morning. What an opportunity today 
to uh, have a special moment dedicating Tom and Jana. <laughs> oh, wait a minute. They've been dedicated for a while, haven't they? A couple years. <laughs> what a blessing. But Aubrey and uh, Lily became Craig's officially about a month ago or six weeks ago. We praise the Lord. And they wanted just as soon as possible to have a time of dedicating to the Lord these beautiful little girls that he has blessed your family with. What a blessing today to be able to do that. going to take you through just a couple things. And Pastor Isaac's up here. He's going to pray a prayer of dedication for these girls as he is their pastor, their children's pastor. And uh, that's the way we roll in the Shire. We just, any old, any old way, we're singing her. <laughs> let, me, let me remind you that little children were brought to Jesus for him to place his hands upon them and to bless them and to pray for them. But wasn't received very well by the disciples for they thought it was a hindrance upon Jesus. And Jesus said, suffer not the little children to come unto me. Do not hinder them. For the kingdom of heaven belongs to those such as these. Because of the innocence of the heart of a child can teach us amazing truths, mom and dad. In presenting these girls for dedication, you signify not only your faith in the Christian faith, but also your desire that they may know and follow the will of God from these earliest days on. In fact, they've been with you two and a half years and have been watching the example of Jesus Christ lived out beautifully before them. Is, is it your turn yet? Okay. It's not. We'll, we'll give her a minute here in just a second. In order to attain that holy end, it will be your duty as their parents to teach these little girls early to fear the Lord. Not fear as in what He could do to them, but reverence. To watch over her, their education, that they not be led astray. To di direct their young minds to the scripture, their feet to the sanctuary. And to restrain them from evil associates and habits to the best of your ability. Uncles, you play a big part in that too. As you live before them, the love of Jesus. So my question to you guys this morning is, will you endeavor to do so? with the help of God to do those things? If so, answer, we will. I now ask the congregation, very important question, will you commit yourself as the body of Christ to support and encourage Tom and Jana in their endeavor to fulfill this holy responsibility to guide their little girls to love Jesus? Will you live Jesus before them? If so, we will, will you answer, we will. Did you hear that? 300 so folks today pledging to join with you. So in just a moment, I'm going to ask Pastor Isaac to pray a prayer of dedication. Normally when we dedicate little six week old or, I don't know, two months old, they're a little easier to hold. I'm going to let you guys continue to be held by mom and dad as Pastor Isaac prays a prayer of blessing. But I want to say something um, just before Isaac prays. And I want to say it to Aubrey and Lily. Aubrey and Lily, you guys want to, you want to answer a question for me? You think you can? We'll see, okay? <laughs> All of these people out here love you guys. Did you know that? They love you. Well, <laughs> hey, 50% ain't bad. Okay? All right. They love you very much. And, and your mommy and your daddy love you. Did you know that? <laughs> and, and funny how they switched. Switched on them. Like I'm going to... And... Um, yeah, <laughs> no, I know, I know. And... As much as your mommy and daddy love you girls, Aubrey and Lily, yes they do, as much as they do, I want you to always remember there is one who loves you more. 
your whole life long. I wonder if you know his name. God, that is absolutely right, Aubrey. Lily's now piping up, God. <laughs> yes, God loves you more than you could ever imagine. And so I'm going to ask Pastor Isaac to pray a blessing of dedication upon you this morning, okay? Isaac. Father, it is our privilege uh, to enjoy the joy and the life of Aubrey and Lily, and so we say thank you for the gift of Aubrey and Lily to our lives. We thank you for the gift that we have to partner with uh, Pastor Tom and Jana as they nurture and, and uh, teach these girls. We thank you for the opportunity that we have right now to lay Aubrey and Lily at your feet, to entrust them to your care, your capable arms of love, of safety, of protection, of wisdom. So we lay them at your feet. We entrust them to your care. We pray that you would bless them from the tops of their heads to the bottoms of their toes, that you would use the mind and the eyes and the ears that you have given them, that you would shape them to see the things that you want them to see, to hear from you through others, through your word, through however you choose to speak, and that they would use their lips to speak words that are kind, words that are loving, words that proclaim who you are for all of us. We pray you would bless their hands and their feet, that their hands would be used to bring about your peace on this earth, that their feet would go where you call them to go. We pray that their hearts would be shaped to beat the way that your heart does, God. So we lay these girls at your feet. We partner with Tom and Jana, and we pray that you would empower us all to do that. In your strong name, Jesus, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, amen. 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 Bless you. God bless you. So proud of you. God bless you. Well, now for the fun stuff, the announcements. Thank you, Taryn. That was a joke. We just did the fun stuff, just so you know. Okay. Right. If I haven't had the chance to meet you and you were sleeping while Pastor Dave was saying it, my name is Isaac. I'm the pastor to kids and families here, and we are glad to be worshiping with you today on Christmas Eve, this last Sunday of waiting for the coming of our King Jesus. There are a few things we want to note. This evening at 6 p.m., we have a Christmas Eve service. We'll be taking communion together and uh, closing our service by candlelight, and so please come back and, and worship with us this evening at 6 p.m. The office will be closed all week this week, and there will be no midweek services. Uh, if you're mailing in a check, uh, so there will be somebody who will be in the office this week just checking the mail and depositing that for you. So, uh, But you could also just put in your check this Sunday or next Sunday if you needed to do that. So no midweek this week. And then next Sunday morning, we have another 10 a.m. service. We'll get back to our regular schedule in 2018. Next Sunday, 10 a.m., be here or you won't be here. Ushers, would you come and we will uh, we'll receive our tithes and our offerings this morning. Let's pray together. Father God, we thank you so much for this opportunity to be together and to proclaim who you are, our Savior, our King. We thank you for the opportunity to give back to you as you have blessed us. We recognize that, that it is from you, and so we give back right now. We, we lay it at your feet. We entrust it to your care, knowing that it will be used for your kingdom and for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.
Thank you for that. I love it. I love seeing people use their gifts for the Lord. Amen? Amen.
Praise His name. We're going to go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Whatever's on your heart today, we just invite you to bow your heads and your hearts before Jesus Christ and surrender to Him your needs today. Brother Isaac, would you please come lead us in prayer today? Lord, it is our privilege to come and adore you, and we do. We adore you. The, the greatest gift to our world in a humble manger. What a testament to who you are. So we say thank you for the gift of Jesus. Jesus, we thank you for the way that you came to us humble, patient, kind, and yet with such a proclamation of who God is. You have revealed to us who our loving God is, and so we say thank you. Through the ways that you lived, through the ways that you spoke, through the ways that you acted, it has been revealed to us, this God we serve. Through the ways that you gave your life, through the ways that through your power we have come to you we see who you are God and so we say we adore you thank you God for that gift thank you for the gift of Emmanuel of you God with us what a gift it is to just be able to walk each and every day being shaped by your spirit, knowing that God is with us. What a gift it is to be a part of the way that you called us to live, of loving you and loving others. What a gift it is to be here together, to, to get to, one, worship you out loud, and two, to worship together, to be with people who care about us, who will laugh with us, who will cry with us, who will talk about the tough things of life with us. So we say thank you for the gift of each other. As we are grateful for the many people who are here, we recognize that some of our sisters and brothers could not make it today. And so we pray, would you continue to remind them of your presence? Would you continue to help us be the tangible hands and feet of you reminding them of our love for them and that even though they are not with us they are with us we recognize that when you came Jesus you showed us what your kingdom looks like a kingdom where there is no sickness no disease and we recognize that right now there are some of us who are dealing with illness disease, broken bones, and we recognize that you have gifted us with doctors, nurses, and medicine, and so we praise you for that gift and pray that you would continue to move among your people, that you would continue to shape the minds of doctors and nurses so that they can be your hands and feet. We also know that sometimes you use just, you choose just to heal people without medicine, and so we pray you would continue to do that. As we are receiving your gift and proclaiming your gift and grateful for your gift, we all know people who, who don't know you, who don't have the gift of relationship with you, and so we pause for a moment to pray for two people by name that we know who need your presence. Thank you, God, for hearing our prayer. Thank you for being a God who cares. And now, Lord, we turn our attention to what you're going to say to us. We anticipate what you're going to say through your servant, Pastor Dave. And so as he comes after we light our Advent candle, we pray that you would help us to focus in on what it is you're saying. Help us to be people of courage who say yes to you. In Jesus' name, amen.
At this time, we will light the fourth candle of our Advent candle, the candle of joy. In the Old Testament, the word joy is nearly always associated with an act of God, and even more specifically, with an act of God delivering his people. The people of Israel found themselves in need of God's deliverance on more than one occasion. When they were enslaved in Egypt, God set them free. As they traveled to the Promised Land, God proved to the Israelites over and over again that He was far stronger and more powerful than the enemy nations who opposed them. When the nation of Israel was carried off into captivity by the Babylonians, again they cried out to God to rescue them. And God delivered them and brought them back to Jerusalem. Each time they were rescued, the Israelites were joyful and rejoiced in God's love for them. But each time they soon forgot God's deliverance and turned away from God. In a cold and dirty stable in the small, unimportant town of Bethlehem, God again delivered his people. This time, however, it was not just for a time, not just until the next warring nation came across the river. This time, it was forever, for eternity. God sent His Son to deliver His people, not just from enemies who threatened them, but from their sin that separated them from Himself. We can imagine the joy on the faces of the shepherds as they made their way to the stable. We can almost see the joy on the faces of the wise men who traveled great distances to find this new king. And we can feel the radiant joy of Simeon and Anna in the temple as they came face to face with the Savior of the world. God sent himself to bring to us life and never-ending joy. Today, as we celebrate Advent, think of joy. Let's not forget. Let's remember and live each day in the knowledge and understanding of what God has done for us. We are delivered. How can we not be joyful? Praise his name. Isaiah, the prophet, chapter 9, verses 6 and 7. We've been staying in it this entire Advent. Let's look at it again this morning. And see what uh, Isaiah spoke of when he talked about the child born unto us. Isaiah chapter 9. Today's title is Prince of Peace. Beginning with the sixth verse. Isaiah wrote, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders. And he will be called a wonderful counselor, a mighty God, an everlasting father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Isaiah's descriptive titles uh, of this child born unto us, we've looked at every week. We looked at the wonderful counselor, the guide to our lives, the one that if we give him half a chance will lead us into righteousness. We talked about the mighty God, that there's nothing that our God can't do, that he, he is all-powerful and omnipotent and has the ability to hear us and care for us. We talked about our everlasting Father, a, a very difficult concept. How do you even discuss everlasting? <laughs> how, do you, how do you talk about a God who pre-existed creation, who spoke the worlds into order? How do, you, how do you discuss a God who lives forevermore and then offers the same gift to us, everlasting life? Today we look at Prince of Peace. Prince of Peace. I want to look at those two words. We won't look at of. There's a break, okay? Because I could probably do 20 minutes on of. But I'll let that one go. I want us to look at Prince. And I want us to look at Peace. Jesus is a Prince. 
He's royalty. A prince is a child born of a king who stands in line for ascension to the throne. Society, you know, is all a Twitter about Prince Harry. Everything's Prince Harry. He's getting married, you know, in May. How excited. I can hardly wait. <laughs> Just telling you. I tune into every talk show that I can that's talking about Prince Harry and the American woman. I don't know her name. One of these days I will. I don't need to know it now. It's not a part of the sermon. Thank you. <laughs> We're all a Twitter about this, uh, this Prince Harry and his wedding coming up. It's been all over everywhere. The news, magazine covers, it's the subject of discussion on talk shows. And I don't know if you know this, but did you know that Prince Harry is seventh in line to become king? Seventh in line to ascend to that throne. It may not ever happen. For all we know, Queen Elizabeth may never die. <laughs> and don't ask me, how did the queen become the king? I don't know. Maybe something was just rolled over to her when... But, but the reality is, Prince Harry is seventh in line to ascend to the throne. I have a news flash for you this morning. You ready? Our Prince Jesus is already a king. He is royalty and he is sitting on the throne of God. Already seated upon the throne. Ruler of all things. That's why Isaiah said it this way in verses 6 and 7. He said the government will be upon his shoulders. It's all upon Jesus. Of the greatness of his government, verse 7, and his peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom. He'll establish it. He'll uphold it with justice and righteousness from that time of his coming on. He's the king. The government of God is on Jesus' shoulders and he, his reign will never end. He is the prince of peace. So that deals with prince let's look at peace a little bit longer we need to understand this peace that Jesus brings this prince this royal one of God well they taught me to come up with three points somewhere they taught me that so I've got six of them today I want to be twice as good I'm just lying to you right now I only got three some of you are happier than you thought you were. Three things I want to say about peace this morning that this reign of Jesus brings to us. The first is peace is found in the tranquility of your soul and mine. The peace that Jesus brings is found in the tranquility of our soul. Numerous times you've heard me or other members of our pastoral team Proclaim something like this. Peace is not the absence of conflict. You know, if, if, if that were the definition of peace, that it's the absence of conflict, there would never be peace. So there can indeed be peace in the, even in the midst of conflict. So it's not that. We can be in conflict and still have peace. Peace is found in the tranquility of a soul. It's a gift that is given to us from Jesus. It's one of the things that he brought into the world, this prince. He brought into the world this opportunity for our souls to be at rest. To experience peace. We can, if not careful, become consumed with anxiety and stress over circumstances. Would you say that's true? Who here has not occasionally been blindsided by some situation? I mean, just out of the blue, something happens. And before you know it, we have fast-forwarded into the worst-case scenario. Does that ever happen to you? <laughs> happens to me more than I wish. How easy it is to be consumed by something that I have no control over until I stop and think about it for a little bit. I really have no control over anything. <laughs> Except 
my confidence in the Prince of Peace. Have you ever noticed that peace and strife don't coexist well together? They don't share a room very well. Kind of like me and any other person outside of my wife. I don't share that room very well with anybody. Not even people I like. Some of the people I like snore. They say I do, but they're lying. They're lying, I tell you. (laughs) Please do not hand Wendy a microphone any time during this message. But peace and strife don't coexist well together. They don't share a room well. Numerous times, this Prince of Peace has spoken peace to my soul in the midst of a crisis. And oh, there's nothing like being in the middle of something and all a tizzy, and then all of a sudden the peace of an almighty God comes into the room and says to us, I've got this. I'm with you. I'll not walk away. I'll travel with you. I'll be what you need in a time of crisis because I'm the Prince of Peace I'm that tranquility in your soul that you don't have without me Stephen Adams wrote a song a long time ago Wendy and I used to sing it often when we were younger we would sing this in revivals and we would sing this at churches and it's 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 a song entitled peace in the midst of the storm it, the star, story was written by Steve Adams. It chronicled how God came close to him in the midst of a natural disaster that occurred when he was driving down a highway and noticed in his rearview mirror that a, t- a funnel cloud was coming down from the sky and it was massive in size and it was right behind him. And he pulled off the road and he pulled into a parking lot of a furniture store and, and he got out of the car and made it into the store at just the moment that the tornado hit the furniture store. He slid underneath a table and took as much cover as he possibly could. And when the storm had passed a few moments later, everything was disheveled and destroyed. And everyone in that furniture store, except him, had died. And he wrote these words. He gives me peace in the midst of the storm. Of my storm-tossed life. Because there's an anchor. There's a rock to cast my faith upon. And then he said, Jesus rides in my vessel. (laughs) So I'll fear no alarm. He gives me peace. In the midst of a storm. I can't think of a more dramatic example for God to speak to Stephen Adams' heart than keeping him safe in the midst of that storm for the purpose, possibly, of writing a song that has been sung through the decades as a reminder of how tranquil it can be to have Jesus in our heart no matter what the storms of life bring. I'll never forget telling that story in a revival in Warrensburg. We were the song evangelists, Wendy and I. And we were telling that story. And Dr. Ralph Earl was the guest evangelist at Warrensburg. He's the one that helped to translate the New International Version. Dr. Earl was a renowned Nazarene. Many of you know the name. Dr. Earl stands up at the beginning of the sermon and he says I want to thank you David for sharing that story he said Stephen Adams was my nephew and I'm going whoa I hope I told that right (laughs) he said you did pretty good with the story he says let me tell you a few more things that he added to what took place that day that forever changed 
not just the Adam's life, but change those who have been impacted through the song. And aren't we often impacted through the lyrics and the melody of songs? Were you not moved when Devon sang that song this morning? Did it not just do something down deep in your soul that you just weren't maybe expecting just to feel the presence of God? Peace is a tranquility of the soul. A second thing peace is, is it, or, or can do, is peace can turn natural enemies into family. That's not an easy thing. But that's one of the things the Prince of Peace can do. And it's the reality that he wants to do it through you and I in this world in which we live. The theologian Charles Feinberg says, quote, Peace is so pleasing to the Lord that the godly are commanded to seek it diligently. Well, let me say it again so you catch it. Peace is so pleasing to the Lord that the godly are commanded to seek it diligently. Peace is a comprehensive and valued gift from God, end quote. I totally agree with Feinberg. In fact, Jesus said it this way in the Beatitudes, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called, what? The children of God. We are so called to desire peace, to seek peace, that God gets into our life and then begins to make us peacemakers in this society. Not rebel rousers. Peacemakers. That the Prince of Peace came and imparted himself to us that we might go and make a difference in a tense culture in which we live. The role of peacemaker in an age of polarized diversity of opinion is sorely needed. Civil discourse has been replaced by shouting matches and talking over the expressed view of a person who has a different opinion than you. What happens is that those who disagree with you become enemies. And metaphorically speaking, if you look at Isaiah in chapter 11, I would love to. Let's do it in just a minute, okay? Metaphorically speaking, the lion intimidates the lamb. The strong personality overwhelms the meek. The great debater silences the one who stumbles a little bit. <laughs> it seems like the one who yells the loudest wins. Jesus desires to bring an element of peace into the world which the prophet Isaiah says Jesus can turn natural enemies into family. I love this imagery of chapter 9 in Isaiah. The prophet speaks in verses 6 through 10. Just listen to this imagery of what the Prince of Peace can bring into the world. Listen to this. He says, a place where the wolf will lie down with the lamb. The leopard will lie down with the goat. The calf and the lion and the yearling together. A little child will lead them. The cow will feed with the bear. Their young will lie down together and the lion will eat the straw like the ox. The infant will play near the cobra's den. The young child will put his hand into the viper's nest. Yet they will neither harm nor destroy on my holy mountain. For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. In that day the root of Jesse will stand as a banner for the peoples. And the nations will rally to him. And his resting place will be glorious. What an image of what peace can bring. We don't see that here. 
we just see polarization and, and enemies arising. One day, ladies and gentlemen, things will be as they're supposed to be. Until that day, when we stand before the Lord Jesus Christ in an environment where there are no natural enemies, where we are all just family, until that day comes, the Prince of Peace desires you and I to be peacemakers. And that can only happen if the Prince of Peace reigns in your heart. The third thing, lastly, peace is assurance for my soul. A little different than the tranquility. The tranquility is this overwhelming presence no matter what I go through. But the assurance for my soul is that I am right with God. You can have assurance that all is well with your soul. John Calvin, who is the father of Calvinism, and uh, uh, many of the mainline denominations are Calvinistic in theology. And just to name a couple, would be like Baptists or Presbyterians, would be Calvinist in their theology. And they, they talk about this assurance of the soul. John Wesley, the father of Wesleyanism, uh, that you might find churches like the Wesleyan Church, the Church of the Nazarene, the Free Methodists, and several other denominations. We also speak about an assurance of the soul that God brings, that the Prince brings to us, the Prince of Peace. Now, there's no question that Calvinism and Wesleyanism we filter it somewhat different in the way that we look at this assurance that God brings. Many of you have heard the phrase before, in a, from a Calvinist point of view, once saved, always saved. You've heard that phrase over and over again. One of the things that a Wesleyan holds on to is this idea that we are free moral agents to choose whether or not we will accept Jesus Christ or not. And because of this free moral agency that Wesleyans have, we believe that we are still free moral agents to decide whether or not we walk away from Jesus later. And so the assurance that we share in this soul peace is not that We can't walk away from God, but it's all about the fact that Jesus Christ has offered us something and Wesleyans and Calvinists agree that there is an assurance of peace in our soul that is a gift from this child born unto us. We don't have to look at it the same way as a Calvinist. Can I tell you something? Are you ready for this? Hang on. Got your seatbelts on. Every theological denomination has faulty theology. Except for the Nazarenes. <laughs> wow. Did you pick the right church or what? I'm just saying. Faulty theology. It's because we do not understand everything and we tend to filter through our own perspective. And I just want to say to you this morning that although I am a strong adherent of a free moral agent who can walk away from Jesus Christ, I am so grateful for what the Calvinists and the Wesleyans and the Assemblies and all of the denominations who call Jesus Christ Lord and Savior are doing on this planet today. We are family. Together, doing our very best to take the Word of God and to understand it and to apply it to our lives. I say to you this morning that the Prince of Peace has brought an assurance to our soul that only God can bring. 
I am so thankful that when we confess our sins to Jesus Christ, that He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all our past. That covers a lot. Some of you, I've read your stories. Ooh, do you have a past? Could I chronicle a couple of them right now? No, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> but we all have a past that has graciously been forgiven through Jesus Christ, this child born unto us 2,000 years ago to bring that assurance, that peace in my soul that says, when I lay my head down tonight, if I don't rise, it's okay. Jesus has me. I'll wake up face to face with the glory of God. This peace that the Prince brings to us, it allows us to keep our focus on Jesus who is in charge of the things that I know of and of the storms before me, the things that I know nothing of, that this Prince of Peace allows me to rest in my soul. So as we think this Christmas Eve morning of our Prince of Peace, may our souls rejoice that He came to reconcile troubled souls, that He came to turn upside down things right side up, that he came to take darkness and implode the world with light. To, to give me hope. The Prince of Peace changed forever the soul of those who received him as the royal son of God. Jesus does indeed reign this morning. He is the Prince of Peace. As we think about uh, heading out into our day and all the things that these next few days hold, I hope you have a remarkable time with your family and friends. I, I hope that this year Jesus Christ graces your home like never before. And amidst all of the hectic things going on, there will be a deep, settled understanding that Jesus is with me. And as we head out of 2017 and begin thinking about 2018, I encourage you to deeply consider journeying with us on January 5th, 6th, and 7th as we have a spiritual renewal weekend together. Friday night, Saturday night, and Sunday morning as we've invited Susie Schellenberger, a very excellent speaker, to come and to just breathe life into us. I hope that you will come and be a part of that. And we're going to have special services for our children ages 4 through 4th grade. It's going to be a great weekend. There is also an opportunity, ladies. Uh, Susie wants to have a brunch at 10 o'clock on Saturday morning with all the women of the church and teenage girls up to just come. And they're going to they're gonna do something called the weakest link. I, I can't come because I don't, I've not been invited. I would be the weakest link in there if I came, but... There's a sign-up sheet out there for the women's brunch. And we just, we just want to enter into this new year thinking about what the psalmist said in 51.10. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Be thinking about it. Come, participate with us all weekend long, January 5, 6, and 7. Pastor Isaac is going to come and dismiss us this morning with a benediction thought. Would you please stand with us together? And again, 
Thank you for coming. Come back tonight. We're going to light the Christ candle. Brand new message dealing with the birth of our Savior. Come and celebrate with our community tonight at 6 o'clock. God bless you. Receive this blessing. And now as we go into the world, may you experience the wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. And may you be an extension of God's grace to God's world. Amen. Go in peace.